Well, you've done incredible uh, research, uh, which more or less says that um, the general idea of the language in Ukraine uh, is something very different. That the Ukrainian speakers, Russian, either you are a Ukrainian speaker, a Russian speaker, a UA, a Ukrainian ethnic, or Russian uh, by your ethnicity, that doesn't influence your political views. How can you explain that? And you said that there is no one language. There is a language, your native language, there is a language of your embeddedness. So how you would define, what's your finding is defining about the language in Ukraine, Ukrainian and Russian in particular? So th there's a group of us scholars that have been trying to figure this out since 2013-14 and in a more systematic fashion. Uh, essentially, for the first time in, in many years, we asked up to uh, 12, 15 different questions about identity. And what we found, for instance, what I found in my earlier uh, research uh, when we were surveying the, the people on the Maidan um, during the Euromaidan mass protest is that people had these dual competing identities. They declared their Russian ethnicity, but then they spoke Ukrainian at home and they spoke Ukrainian at work and so on and so forth. And we found the same thing in our research, that a lot of people have these multiple, if, if you were to choose only the question about native language or so-called mother tongue, the language that you supposedly grew up with, and you decide to plug that into your uh, analysis, as the thing, whether or not it determines politics, you'll probably find a correlation. But if you start examining the difference between the language someone declared as their mother tongue and the difference between the language that they say they use every day at home and then the language that they use at work and then the actual, uh, the actual questionnaire that they decided to take, you all of a sudden realize that th these are different languages and that this person is trying to tell you some kind of identity in, in one case, so mother tongue, a native language tends to be some kind of identification, ethnic identification. Um, the questionnaire that they take and the language that they use throughout the survey is their personal, the, the language that they feel most comfortable with. The language that they use at home, that's a type of embeddedness because that might be uh, the language that is, uh, you know, it could be actually bestowed upon them by their partner, right? Or maybe a grandparent lives in the house and they're bringing the Russian or Ukrainian language in the house. And then the other type of embeddedness, the language that they use at work. Together, when you start throwing these into your equation and you start analyzing them, t you start realizing that language is not always uh, a key driver of political preferences or, or policy or behavior. Sometimes it may be, right? So your views on language policy and language law in Ukraine are highly correlated to the languages you speak, for instance, and the language you uh, are, are using at home, for instance. But coming back to this classical Western media yeah. type of the thing, Russian language, Russian speakers, Ukrainian speakers, Russian speakers probably supporting Russia more, Ukrainian speakers probably are pro-EU and pro-NATO. How would you break this? Well, it's just there's no such thing as, you know, which, what, what are you talking about when you're talking about Ukrainian speakers? Is it the people who declare their mother tongue? Is it the people who took the Ukrainian uh, survey? Or is it the people who say they speak Ukrainian at home? And the same with the Russian speakers. And the same with the Russian. And they might be doing all those things differently. So when you pick and choose which of those cr uh, variables or criteria you're going to use, I found, so we're not going to now out various scholars who are my friends, but we went and did, um, with Henry Hale, we went through all the different uh, uh, articles we could find and we tried to pinpoint what type of survey question did they use to declare Russian speakers do this and Ukrainian speakers do that, or Russian speakers believe this and Ukrainian speakers do that. They all use different questions. You, they used the question that best suited them in some cases. So yeah. just the finding like to, to, to to oversimplify your, yeah. your survey and your finding of your survey, what does it mean? That Ukraine is incredibly bilingual? What is the, the identity of this country? How the language come into this? And how the West? How the, you know, any foreign journalist coming here should work with the language, uh, trying to describe that, uh, knowing your findings? 
Well, it's just, it's just not a binary thing. It's not either or. And the, the sooner that Westerners, whether they are academics, journalists, or diplomats, come to terms with that, you know, that's, it's, it's just not either or Ukrainian speaker uh, or Russian speaker, either or Ukrainian ethnic, Russian ethnic. These things are on a, on a so for, even for ethnicity, when we ask people to, do, it's a forced choice, you have to choose, are you Ukrainian or are you Russian? Um, that they answer differently to when they have to, on a scale of uh, one to five, say how Russian do they feel or how Ukrainian do they feel. They answer those things differently. So it's telling us that we have really, it's a multilingual, multi-ethnic country and there's many multi-ethnic and multilingual families. There's of course unilingual families and uni-ethnic families on the, as well, on either side of the equation. But they're, they're missing the majority of Ukraine, which is entirely bilingual. How should then people understand how this influences Ukrainian politics and the feeling of the Ukrainians and being the citizens of this country? See, the, 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 it, they, just, they can't simplify it to this binary either or thing. The second you do that in Ukraine, you're going to miss a huge aspect and you're going to not understand the population. Uh, it's just. What we're seeing is that socioeconomic inequality maps on to region uh, a great deal better than, in some cases, language and ethnicity, okay. right? So let's get into that. Maybe that would make it easier to explain. You also said that the regions are important, but the regions not defined by the language, but something else. We, our initial results show us that you, can, it's, you can't get rid of the importance of region in your analyses. Statistically, it's, it's next to impossible. But there's different ways, depending on what you control for and you know, what, you, what you think of. Language and ethnicity don't always matter. So that tells me that region is something else. And that tells me that we need to turn to political economy, uh, that we need to speak to our political economist friends, uh, that we need to understand what else is different about these regions. History might be one thing, culture might be one thing, but certainly it seems like political economic inequality, specifically economic inequality, is hugely important. So if we think to ourselves that some, some, if some regions are more unequal than others, so you can still have a very poor region in the West, but perhaps it's more equal than a region in the south or east. And it's that inequality that can drive, and that feeling of inequality that can drive dissatisfaction with certain things or can connect people to certain pol political preferences. Uh, and that's not, that's not new or different to Ukraine. We see that pattern across various countries, across all of Europe and North America and beyond. Inequality is an incredibly, or this feeling of unfairness and inequality economically is an incredibly important driver. Another thing that seems to overlap on region quite strongly in Ukraine is the feeling that one was uh, a loser of transition. There are regions in Ukraine where, where people who reside in those regions feel more strongly about being losers of transition. And that and which tr transition do you mean by these? It's 1991, the, 1991. The, yeah, the, the transition is from 1991. So if they perceive themselves as economic or political losers of that transition, um, they are more likely to, they have certain views on the conflict, they are less likely to support NATO, they are less likely to support a European associ association or further membership and so on and so forth. They're actually less likely to support democracy, point blank. Yeah. Uh, so again, this is not new across the post-Soviet space, but we're not talking about those things enough. We keep focusing on language and we want to simplify Ukraine, you know, draw this really awful, neat line that separates the country into two spaces. It, that's just not, that's, it hasn't been that way for a while. And, you know, quite frankly, any analyst who says that, you know, Ukraine is a divided country between East and West, between Russophones uh, and, and Ukrainophones and so on and so forth, is just not getting it. And, and it seems like they haven't looked at the statistics for the past, if not five, then, you know, sorry, if not 10, then the last five years. It's just very clear. Um, and just for the, the Western audience, I think the thing that is 
surprising to many of us who study this is when journalists say things like, oh, okay, well, you know, people who have a strong patriotism, they are more likely to be Ukrainian speakers. Yeah, there is a correlation but it's not something that necessarily drives. Patriotism is very strong amongst Russian speakers um, in this country. Patriotism is very strong among some people that identify ethnically as Russian. So it's, it's worth exploring those groups a little bit further and understanding what causes their patriotism and inversely what takes people away from the, the patriotism in other cases. And the final, how you then read the results of the president elections yeah. and the fact that it's true that we have the president who speaks differently about the identity and about language than the previous one yeah. and that he has this massive support um, as well. How, and that for you wasn't a surprise. It's not that it wasn't a surprise. I mean, many people could have looked at some of the stats and seen that there was this huge disenchantment with Poroshenko, and up to a year ago, yeah? So much of the sociology was absolutely excellent in Ukraine, and I think that, you know, uh, Vladimir Panyoto and his group at Kiss, for instance, but also um, uh, Ms. Dr. Bekeshkina and, and several others that have really done great research. Uh, I, I have actually heard some foreign journalists say they don't trust Ukrainian statistics, but they really should because they got it right on the money this time around. Um, there was a huge disenchantment with the current political elite. There was a lot, very high disapproval of Poroshenko. And throughout the campaign, it was like Poroshenko and his campaign were just not getting it. They were talking about uh, language, um, faith, and war, which just wasn't, you know, if you look at the top three priorities, okay, war is up there. Um, he was certainly it not. It wasn't war, it was army. It was about army, peace. Army, thank that you. Wasn't, that the point, it wasn't about the war. Yes. It was about the army. Army, you're right, absolutely. Uh, thank you uh, for correcting me. Uh, yes. Exactly. It wasn't because army doesn't. Ca that's there is too many people who doesn't care about the army. They Ex care about the war. No, exactly. No, because it, it wasn't about. It wasn't the experience of war. It was exactly about this other thing. It was this patriotic militarist uh, message. It was just something that was not for central Ukraine. It was certainly not for eastern and southern Ukraine. And in Ukraine to win the elections, I don't know how many times I have to say this till I'm blue in the face. You have to win central Ukraine. And focusing on what is a rather restrictive language policy, for instance, was a mistake in the campaign. Um, the faith thing, the religious th the Tomos, that was very important, but perhaps it wasn't actually a very smart strategy for a political campaign year. Uh, and the army, although that can be a rallying uh, focal point for some voters, it's certainly not uh, going to win you the, the big numbers. So there's this m missing element. Um, focusing on the successes of the last five years, there have been many successful reforms. How come that wasn't front and center? Decentralization, hugely successful, hugely popular, uh, where it happened for the most part, hugely successful. Uh, that, for some reason, that wasn't focus. You know, this is a successful policy that we have brought to you, we will continue it right? Um, or uh, focus on socioeconomic inequalities, this thing that I mentioned before. That wasn't happening. And uh, to finalize as well for Western viewers, um, foreign viewers, so how you also would nail down the general understanding of the Ukrainian identity, if you look also to these elections probably, uh, because there is something about like we can speak more about the civic identity at this stage as well. And we can, of course, say that the campaign was like anti Poroshenko, and uh, of course, there would be disappointment with Zelensky, and it's so much again elite uh, not in favor. However, there is something he represents. There yeah. was something people found in this campaign. Uh, so, what do you find there as well? Uh, which was resonant uh, also in the contents of what's happening in the region. Where do you look at? And maybe then you can get into the Ukrainian identity. So you asked me like five questions. Yeah, <laughs> but somehow in my head, um, the goals all go together. Therefore they I get it. So I think the important thing that so many people have missed in recent studies of Ukraine is that there is this 
the nominally strong sense of civic identity or attachment to homeland, as Grigol Popelikish and Graham Robertson um, have argued. People are attached to this the state of Ukraine and they can be extremely patriotic about it. And this has only grown since 91. So more and more people are declaring this attachment. That is, that is truly important. Uh, so I think maybe to some people, you know, I, I think a lot of people voted for Zelensky not because they voted for him, but because they voted against someone. I think that's a very large group. But I think a lot of people saw in him the type of citizen that they may be, right? If you look at his, you know, his, his, his show, uh, which I had a very hard time watching the first time around, but after these elections I watched completely enthralled, uh, because all of the main characters in that show are trying to do the right thing, are trying to do the right thing for the Ukrainian state, but you know the system is against them, the oligarchs are against them, and their own family members get in the way. In all of these characters, it's the husband, the wife, the so it's society as a whole. So maybe a lot of citizens of Ukraine, you know, they, they think to themselves, yes, I'm a patriot, I'm trying to do the right thing, but it's difficult in this setting. And that's frustrating me, and maybe they felt that the previous politicians didn't get that. I think the previous politicians just weren't focusing on bread and butter issues. Um, and I'm talking about previous president, wasn't focusing on bread and butter issues, when in the last five years, a majority of Ukrainians got poorer, right? They are ha the people, especially in the South and East, are having a harder time just getting by. And you might not feel it always in the big cities, or you do feel it, but you feel it differently. But it's the reality is that people are really struggling. And of course, a, no politician can fix that. There's no magic wand. But avoiding that topic entirely it seems like you are detached from reality. And maybe that's what people think about Zelensky. They think that he is connected to those realities a little bit more. I don't know about that. Um, surprisingly, there's still very little research done on whether people voted for him or his character. It's a, on his television character. It's about time we did that because, uh, you know, I wonder if people identify him with what the campaign is saying or with him with what they saw on television. And with him who has been in the Ukrainian public life for I've 20 been, years. Exactly, yeah. But I think one thing, so what, one of the things I often talked about is that this is very much, a, you know, the, the Dnipropetrovsk clan or Dnipro clan now is very much connected to this presidency and to this party. These were the movers and these were important movers and shakers from the, the earliest periods of Ukrainian politics and transition. These, um, these individuals are in fact all in support of sustaining and promoting the Ukrainian state. It may have been for their own economic benefit, but these are not, we can't say that the people that are backing Zelensky or the party, that, that they're not necessarily patriots or something like this. I think this is a mistake. And I think when citizens hear this kind of critique, they react quite strongly, because they think it's a critique of them. And once again, as we already established, the stats show they feel very strongly that they are patriots. So whenever you try to tell them that they're doing something that's not patriotic enough, it just pushes them further away. I probably would add, I felt like this physical pain of some members of the Zelensky team who've been accused of being not kind of pro-Maidan, that they say like, we were there. Yeah. We, we who maybe haven't seen this, but that's just unfair. Like, so that's quite a... You know, and think about, there were, there were probably millions of Ukrainians who wanted to be there and felt really strongly in favor, but they couldn't be for various reasons. And so they think when people, if only, if you can only be a true Ukrainian patriot by physically being present in the protest, then you're, if that's the, the kind of weird myth we're going to develop, that's missing the, the, the kind of, the, the, 
the, the real ethos of the Evromaidan, because the Evromaidan was sustained by so many people who couldn't come physically, but they would donate financially, or they would come and bring food or something else. Physically being here wasn't the only way you could support Maidan, right? You could do a lot of other, and same thing with uh, currently the war. There's various ways that people are supporting these things from a, a distance because they, that's all that they can do. Uh, so I think when you, when you focus only on that, you kind of miss, miss uh, you know, the, the Evro Maidan was an all national phenomenon and it supported the, 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 the discarding of uh, Yanukovych was supported by 75% of the population. Uh, that's a huge number, right? Uh, so when you think of that 75 and y you think that, the, you know, so some of those people voted for Zelensky, they, y if, you, if, you, if you demonize them, you're going to miss a huge chunk of very, very, very strong feeling patriots.